Professor Shuhai Zhao, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from your office at Virginia Tech, USA. You are a paleobiologist and geobiologist studying the interactions between the biosphere and its environments at critical transitions in our planet's history, specializing in that mysterious time that led up to the explosive first appearance of animals on Earth known as the Cambrian period. So how have you been doing, Shuhai? Uh, things are getting back to normal in much of the world, finally. So uh, have you been able to get back out into the field to uh, continue your research? Uh, yeah, things are getting better now. Uh, we're getting back to normal. Uh, my university mm -hmm. has announced that that instruction will be in person in fall 2021. So that's great. The university stadium uh, will be operated in full capacity next semester. Um, we have been able to do some field work nearby. Uh, so mm -hmm. in fact, last week, uh, I took some of my students to look at some of the rocks in Southwest Virginia, uh, about a couple yeah. of hours uh, drive from here. Uh, but international tra travel is still uh, very much limited. Uh, so we haven't been yeah. able to travel internationally and I would love to do that because uh, a lot of my field site is in, in Asia and in South America. Uh, so hopefully, um, you know, hopefully later soon. this year or next year, uh, we'll be able to do international travel and they able to see some rocks uh, outside the U.S. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Well, I've wanted to do a show about the Cambrian explosion for a very long time now, and so I'm really looking forward to this. But before we start, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Shuhai, what led you into the world of science, and in particular, this period of Earth's past that existed between 500 million and 600 million years ago? So I, I did my undergraduate in geology uh, at Peking University uh, some years ago, and uh, uh, then I worked a couple of years um, in the industry and at Acad Academy. Um, before I uh, pursued my PhD degree in biology uh, at Harvard University. So my background is geology and biology, and mm. uh, I really was, was interested in you know, this interaction between the biosphere and the environment because of my background in both geology and, and biology. And it, and it take it back into uh, geological past. And I chose to study this Ediacan Cambrian transition because this is a time period around 500, 600 many years ago where animals began to radiate, uh, began to expand ecologically to make an impact on uh, the surface environment of the Earth. Um, and also because this, this is the, the enigmatic nature of the so-called so Cambrian explosion, uh, which has puzzled uh, many scientists that since Charles Darwin identified this phenomenon. Uh, as a major unresolved scientific question. Um, so I, I, I sort of saw this as a, as a challenge, but also as an opportunity to make some contributions to improve our understanding of the early evolution of, of life on Earth. And so that's the thing about Darwin, isn't it? He, um, he, he was able to pinpoint a lot of things, but he didn't fully understand all of it. Right. Uh, you know, we have to put that in a historical context because, you know, at his time, uh, there, there were little fossils, little fo virtually no Precambrian fossils. So that was very puzzling to him. And uh, in the last 160 years, uh, a lot of new discoveries. So things have changed. I, and I think if Darwin lived it today, uh, he would be you know, very happy to see all these uh, uh, new discoveries in the, in the you know, rocks older than the Cambrian. Okay, let's talk about the Cambrian period. People have probably heard of the so-called Cambrian explosion, but they may not fully understand what occurred during this geologic time period. So can we begin by having an overview of the Cambrian and what is meant by the Cambrian explosion? Yeah, the, the Cambrian explosion. Um, <laughs> I, I personally prefer the term Cambrian 
radiation, but they basically mm -hmm. uh, means the same thing. Uh, what it means is a geologically rapid episode of evolution uh, in which animal became became you know diverse and abundant and it became ecologically important. And it happened in the early part of the Cambrian period, which is a, a period of about 55 many years, starting at about 542 uh, and ending at uh, 485 many years ago. And the Cambrian explosion lasted about 30 many years during the Cambrian period, so from 540 to about 510. So it's about the first half of the Cambrian period. So the Cambrian explosion is actually a pretty long period if, if from our perspective. I would like to emphasize a few aspects of the Cambrian explosion. Uh, first, the Cambrian explosion is not uh, about the origin of life. Okay, the origin of life occurred three and a half billion years ago or earlier. The Cambrian explosion is about animals, and the an animal is just you know, a small part of, of you know, the biosphere. Second, the Cambrian explosion is not about the origin of animals. Uh, the origin of animals happened before the Cambrian. And the Cambrian explosion of radiation is about the rapid expansion diversification of animals. So that was you know, what the Cambrian Explosion was not. But what the Cambrian Explosion is, it basically can break down into three things. One I just mentioned is the you know, rapid, when I say rapid, I meant geologically rapid in the 30 minute years. Uh, that's a lot of time to put it in context the entire evolutionary history of our genus, Homo, is just about two to three many years. So the Cambrian explosion is 10 times more than that. Wow. But what makes the Cambrian explosion important is that you know, after uh, uh, 500, 510 many years ago, there's nothing like this ra rapid uh, radiation or rapid diversification of animals. So during that that 30 many years, almost all major animal phyla uh, evolved, and there are about 20, 25 of them. And in the, in, in the next 510 many years, no new animal phyla uh, evolved. So that's what makes us a very unusual, unique, uh, interesting, uh, event. So that's the number of animals, right? The variety of animals, but also the Cambrian explosion is about the rapid evolution of skeletonized and particularly mineralic skeletonized animals like shells and, and, uh, and you know, clams and things like that. Now, again, this is not about the origin of animal biomineralization. The origin of animal biomineralization happened a little about 10 many years before the Cambrian explosion. But the Cambrian explosion is a time when skeletonized animals rapidly expand and diversify. And a third, the Cambrian explosion, it's also characterized by a very rapid expansion of animal activities that left choices and trails and barrels in the sedimentary rock record. So if you go to take a look at you know, Cambrian rocks and compare that to Pre-Cambrian rocks, you see the difference visually. Mm. And again, this is not about the origin of animal locomotion. It's not about the origin of animal burrowing, because uh, that happened before the Cambrian. But it's be, uh, the Cambrian explosion is a time when you know, these mobile animals uh, began to diversify, began to 
to interact with the sediment begin to leave uh, you know, a large amount, a great diversity of what, what we call trace fossils in the, in the rock record. So three things, two things that came here are not, they're not you know, about the origin of life, not about the origin of, of animals. And the three things about what the Cambrian explosion is, is about rapid diversification of animals, variety of animals. It's about the, you know, the, the diversification of skeletonized or biomineralized animals. It's about diversification of mobile animals that you know, left a trace in a geological record. Right, and for anyone who doesn't know, a trace fo fossil is not a fossil itself. It's like a, a burrow or a track or an impression. Isn't that right? Exactly. So burrows, tracks, tra trails, and things like that. That. So if you you know watch a uh, if you go to the beach and and a look at the uh, uh, the uh, ocean uh, bottom, sometimes they see you know tracks made by crabs, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a you know, if it's fossilized, then it's a trace fossil. So yeah. what kind of animals lived during the Cambrian period? Uh, that's what really puzzled Charles Darwin uh, 160 uh, years ago. So when you look at, and even by then, uh, they, they are a lot of Cambrian fossils, you know, they perhaps the best known are trilobites, right? Uh, yeah. And, and uh, this is an area where paleontologists that make a unique uh, contribution, uh, paleontologists like me, um, you can't find an answer anyway in any other ways, only by looking at the fossil record. Uh, can you answer this question? What kind of animals uh, lived in the Cambrian Ocean? Uh, so during the Cambrian, and if you go to look at some Cambrian rocks, what do you find is, you know, there are a lot of arthropods uh, fossils, just like today, if we look at modern uh, biosphere, uh, arthropods are the most diverse, dominate uh, animals, and uh, so they were in the Cambrian. Uh, so there's some familiar tri uh, arthropods like trilobites that I mentioned, but also there are a number of very bizarre and strange uh, arthropods uh, lived in the that lived in the in the Cambrian. Uh, things like anomalocry, sometimes you, uh, you probably see that in the news, uh, or Pabinia. Uh, so those are very strange arthropod animals uh, back in the Cambrian. Uh, but there are also other types of animals like sponges and other phylum that are still living with us today, brachiopods uh, that are still with us today, mollusks, uh, and that's your, your uh, nautiloids and uh, oysters and the clams and the scallops, uh, modern representatives of mollusks. But the phylum mollusks is also represented in the Cambrian fossils. And, and uh, surprisingly, there's a, a group of animals known as uh, preapulates um, hmm. that get that's also known as a, known as a penis worm. Uh, that that relatively common in 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 several Cambrian deposits, including the famous Berger Shale uh, biota in Canada and uh, uh, the slightly older uh, Qingjiang biota in South China. Uh, so that's a, a little surprising because preapulates are not that common in modern ocean. Uh, so, and, and like I said, you know, there are about 20, 25 or so animal phyla that are, that are uh, you know, living today. And all of them were, were you know, represented during the Cambrian. And uh, some of them I, I, I have relatives that look very strange uh, from modern perspective. Uh, so not only animals, obviously, you know, there are seaweeds, algae, microbes uh, and other type of protists uh, that lived in the Cambrian oceans. Um, the Cambrian land ecosystem, however, uh, was very different from today. Um, mm. So vascular plants, land plants, uh, have not evolved, not yet uh, evolved during the Cambrian. Uh, so the land ecosystem was probably uh, colonized only by microbes in the Cambrian period. 
So there are no lab plants uh, in the Cambrian, uh, at least you know, from the fossil record, uh, we didn't see any, any macroscopic uh, lab plants uh, in the Cambrian. And so uh, the most famous ones, of course, are trilobites, and they lived for such a long time, but they disappeared relatively quickly, didn't they? Yeah, they, they disappeared about 250 many years uh, ago. So they lasted from, let's say, you know, 520 to uh, 250 uh, many years ago. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, more than 270 many years of, of time. Um, and they're most abundant in the Cambrian and in the subsequent uh, period, the Ordovician period. Um, and, and that's when, you know, they evolve very fast and we can use them to uh, correlate rocks uh, deposited in different parts of the world. All right. And uh, just one last thing on this, which comes to mind is there, there is one particular creature, which is so odd. It was named after a, a hallucination. I think it was, they call it hallucinogenia. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very interesting um, fossil and it has a very interesting uh, uh, history in terms of its uh, research. Uh, hallucinogenia is one of the fossils that uh, uh, look catalyzingly similar to some living animal phyla, uh, living animal group, uh, a group called omnicophorin, um, but also you know, different in some aspects. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it, it has a uh, you know, paired legs, but also has you know, spikes on the back. So initially paleontologists didn't see the paired legs but they saw the pale spikes on the back. So they thought that the spikes were legs and they're, they're walking on the spikes. Yeah, they had uh, it upside down, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. they had it upside down. It's and not until later, <laughs> yeah, when they, it's not until later when the uh, pale legs were uh, discovered, then we had paleontologists who were able to, you know, uh, to turn it uh, in the right, uh, right position. Well, the Cambrian explosion was a sudden, geologically speaking, appearance of all kinds of relatively simple animals. It's when shells and hard parts, the precursors to skeletons, first evolved. And it's thanks to this innovative period that the world later saw fish, reptiles, and eventually mammals. But why do we think this explosion happened? What are some of the theories? Uh, Mark, this is a really good question. And... Uh, um... I would not pretend that we had the final say and uh, not pretend that we have solved this question, but there are several uh, hypotheses um, to account for, you know, when the Cambrian explosion happened, when did, and the magnitude of this, uh, this evolutionary event. And, and one of the earlier hypotheses was that, you know, this was related to the chemical explosion was related to an, an episode of oxygen increase. Uh, when you think about that, it's not surprising because all animals uh, need oxygen to survive and they need a lot of oxygen to survive, particularly if they are, they are act, you know, metabolically active. Uh, animals that need to move, some animals are predators, they have to move fast and the prey need to escape from the predators. So they need oxygen to support their very high metabolic rate, um, specific metabolic rate. Uh, so that's what's the first hypothesis. Uh, but recent research uh, seems to suggest that, uh, yes, oxygen is a requirement for uh, animal evolution. Uh, but the, it's not a limiting requirement. Oxygen, perhaps, uh, you know, this requirement perhaps was met uh, long before the Cambrian explosion. Uh, so that indicates something else uh, triggered the Cambrian explosion. And what that something else is, um, this something else could be the you know, evolution of new genetic wiring. Uh, that allowed the development of morphologically complex animals that can per perform certain functions 
that ultimately led to positive ecological feedbacks. Um, for example, you know, I mentioned predation uh, predators, uh, and that involves a lot of coordination uh, and, and local motion, and that involves you know a complex neural system, muscular system, and things like that. And ultimately, you need the that genetic uh, network, genetic wiring, uh, to develop these capabilities. And once this is put in place, then it's possible for animals to perform certain function uh, that may uh, lead to positive ecological feedback. And, and uh, for example, the arms race between the predators and the prey that you know, accelerate um, evolutionary rate. That, so that can account for the magnitude of the Cambrian explosion. So the so, appearance of predators in, in, could have started it off. Yeah, yeah. So, so it could have uh, could have uh, accelerated. So that's a, a contributing factor uh, that led to the you know explosion. Is uh, you know if we use the explosion analogy, um, you need you need some sort of uh, uh, fuse and then the explosives. Uh -huh. So yes. the the ecological feedback, the predator and the prey sort of positive feedback are the are the explosives, if we will. So uh, when so you say an arms race, you mean like uh, a predator would come after certain prey and they would over time develop harder shells to protect themselves and in turn the prey would perhaps uh, evolve, I don't know, sharper, you know, uh, claws to get through the shells and so on and so forth. Exactly. Exactly. So you know uh, they, you know, when the predators find a way to you know catch the prey, the prey find a way to escape from the predator, and the predator find a better way of doing his business. Um, yeah. And there was uh, also uh, a theory about uh, the beginning of eyes and, and vision as well. Yeah, I saw that as a part of this this uh, ecological feedback. Obviously, you need first you know, have the genetic capability to make an eye, which is a very complex structure. Uh, but some of the genes uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, contribute to the uh, de development of eyes uh, pre-exist the animals. So basically they have to have the capability to sense light, um, but they are more than that. But once you have the uh, the capability to sense light, to uh, to view the world, uh, you can perhaps uh, it, you know, better escape from the predators, right? So that's part mm -hmm. of the part of the uh, predation prey uh, positive feedback. But I think uh, you have said that you think it might be a combination of these things. Is that right? Right. right. So I think it's a combination. So the genetic. Might you can think this as a fuse, and the mm -hmm. ecological feedback you can you can think this as an explosive, to use that analogy. Um, and uh, you know, oxygen. Uh, you you need to have oxygen, obviously. To for explosive to happen, you have to have oxygen, right? So otherwise, you know, you can't you can't the chemical reaction would not happen, uh, would not happen without oxygen. Uh, so all the things have to be in place, uh, but you know whether which one comes first, which one comes later. That's the the uh, the debate now. Uh, so the last piece of the contributing factor would be the limiting factor. Well, there are those who say that the Cambrian explosion was so sudden, and then its animals appeared so seemingly out of nowhere that it was akin to a creation event and that nothing existed before this time. But there was a period before the Cambrian that we now call the Ediacaran. So uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so so the, the Ediacaran period, that's the reason I uh, study uh, paleontology and I've been working on the Ediacaran period for a number of years now. Uh, so like Mark, like you, you mentioned, the Ediacaran period uh, precedes the Cambrian period, and it started about 
635 many years ago and ended uh, where the Cambrian starts, so ended about mm. 540 many years ago. So the Eocene period is about 95 many years in duration, so that's much longer wow. than the Cambrian period. So in Darwin's time, uh, there, there were virtually no Pre-Cambrian fossils, no Ediacaran fossils. Uh, not to you know, not not to mention uh, Ediacaran animals. There's no fossils, uh, Ediacaran fossils known to them. Period. Uh, so this is this is why Darwin gets so frustrated, and mm. uh, you know, this is a, one of his uh, great uh, headaches uh, because his natural selection theory predicts. Uh, the existence of animals before the Cambrian. Now, in that last, uh, particularly in that last uh, 60 years, uh, there have been remarkable discoveries about Ediacaran uh, fossils and, and uh, including Ediacaran animal fossils. Um, and, and I happen to uh, have a few pieces of specimens here I can show it to you, and uh, uh, including things like this. This is a you know, a decking sound here. Uh, so in the, in this white color, uh, let's see, you can see this. Um, yeah. So there's a, this is a piece of decking sound here fossil, uh, about 560 many years old. Uh, so it's so circular. That, it's a bit like a plate, isn't it? It's a bit like plate and there's some structures, uh, in, in it. And, and, uh, you can probably get better pictures online. Um, Sometimes it's a tiny, sometimes it, it be half meter in, in diameter. Uh, and, and it can move. Um, it can, you know, move. And, uh, that suggests is some sort of mobile animals. And I have another piece of, uh, this is, uh, about 500, 550 many years old. Wow. And you can see this little thing here. This is a, this is a, the try. This is the trail of the animal. Okay. Oh, yes. This is a trail, and this is the animal itself. Oh. So this is the animal was moving on the bedding surface, uh, yes. leaving a trail behind it, and then died. And then the the trail and the animal body were preserved together. So we can now. So not only say that you know, this animal was mobile, but we can link the mobile animals and the trail it made. Wow. But a lot of times you just see things like this. So this was a, you know, a, uh, just a trail, just a, you know, the, the trace fossil. And yes. it, this is a, uh, a trace fossil that, uh, I'm sorry, okay, left and right is, is uh, uh, so this is a, a barrel. Mm -hmm. And then it'll come out and make another barrel and come out and make another barrel. So there are a lot of this trace fossils in the Ediacaran period. And also, uh, there were Ediacaran skeletonized animals, animals that learned uh, how to make a uh, biomineralized skeleton. So there are animals in the uh, Ediacaran. There are mobile animals with that make traces in the Ediacaran. They are also uh, biomineralized animals in the Ediacaran period. Uh, what that means is that the Cambrian explosion has a prehistory in the preceding Ediacaran period. At least, you know, about 10 to 30 many years before the Cambrian explosion, you sort of see this prelude to the Cambrian explosion, um, that where animals evolved, mobile animals evolved, and biomineralizing animals also evolved. I think Darwin would be certainly be you know, pleased to, to see this uh, fossil evidence that, that I, I just showed you. Absolutely. So yes, animals, Cambrian animals did not come from nowhere. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, I guess they weren't terribly obvious because there weren't that many hard parts or shells or, or, or skeletons. Uh, they, were, they were soft bodies mostly. So uh, paleontologists basically missed them. Yes. Um, 
they are soft body, so that requires a uh, unusual uh, preservational condition for them to be preserved in the fossil record. So I suspect most of them are soft body. The ones that I showed you, there are a few that are that had 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 hard parts, uh, but they are also you know less common and they're less diverse as far as we can tell from the fossil record. So that makes it more difficult to uh, you know, mm. get a full picture to you because know, if you have a lot of this, so that that's what make Cambrian expulsion uh, 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 important because that's a, you know you see a, a radiation or expansion of animals, uh, but but they they are pre-Cambrian Ediacaran uh, animal fossils, uh, just that most of them are soft-bodied. Um, and they're probably very few, and they're also very relatively simple uh, compared to the Cambrian ones. Right, and I know that that I think I'm right in saying that one of the the remaining problems is linking up what could have evolved into what in the Cambrian. In other words, what are some of the uh, possible? Are there ancestors rather in, in the Ediacaran, for instance? Where did trilobites evolve from? Um, there is a creature called Sprigina, which looks a bit like a trilobite. Could that have been its ancestor? Yeah, so that's still uncertain. And I think you raised a very important question. Uh, just because there were animals in the Ediacaran does not mean that those Ediacaran animals were direct ancestors to the Cambrian animals. Uh, but what that suggests is that because you have animals in the Ediacaran and you have animals in the Cambrian. Even mm. if the Ediacaran animals were not the direct ancestor of the Cambrian animals, the occurrence of animals in both Ediacaran and the Cambrian means that at least some of the animals must have crossed the Ediacaran and Cambrian boundary, unless you know, the Ediacaran animals and the Cambrian animals are uh, evolved independently or hmm. evolved de novo, uh, that is less likely uh, because, you know, animals have so many, uh, as far as we know, animals evolved once and on once, um, the capability for locomotion, um, the, and some of the, for example, this one, you can see it is a bilateral symmetric animal, just like, you know, many of the hmm. living animals. That has a left and right and a head and a, a tail and a back and a belly side. And that that construction, body construction, mm. involves a complex set of genetic apparatuses. And uh, that complex genetic apparatuses evolved only once. So, so even if this one is not a direct ancestor of a Cambrian animal, um, it used the same set of genes, uh, mm -hmm. make the body, uh, make the animal body. So that means uh, some of the, the, the they're relative to the Cambrian, they're cousins to the Cambrian animals. Um, uh, Shihai, these periods of time are so long ago, 500 million to 600 million years ago. It's quite mind boggling. Carbon dating is probably useless in gauging these time periods. So how does science determine the age of fossils and trace fossils that existed so far back in time? Uh, yes, Mark, um, you're right that carbon dating is probably not very useful nope. <laughs> in determining the age uh, of this Cambrian and the Akron, uh, rocks. Uh, but there are other techniques that scientists can use to date older rocks. Uh, there's a technique called uranium lead uh, dating. The principle is the same as carbon-14 dating. Basically, you have a radioactive isotope uh, that decays at a regular pace. So you can, uh, you can, you, you can look at how many of the daughter isotope uh, and uh, how, how, how many of the uh, parent isotopes remain in the system and uh, calculate the age. So the principle is the same. Uh, just mm. the, the geological clock, so to speak, that we use to date all the rocks is a slow clocks than the carbon-14 
clock. So the carbon-14 clock ticks very fast. So it's better, uh, it's best for younger rocks because in older rocks, all the carbon-14 is gone and it virtually has no carbon-14 to, mm. to analyze, right? But there are other radioactive decay system that, that you know, decays very slowly. Uh, the half-life of carbon-14, for example, is a little less than 6,000 years. So it's good for uh, typically, you know, 10 half-lives. So 10 half-life, each half-life, the pan isotopes uh, uh, decreases by, uh, by 50%. So after 10 half-lives, it's T to the 10s. So it's about 1,000 of uh, what was originally there is still remaining. So, you know, carbon-14 is good for samples that are younger than, you know, let's say 50,000 years or 60,000 years uh, in age. For this 500, 600 many year old sample, you need to have uh, uranium lead that has a much longer half-life um, to be able to uh, uh, determine their age. But the principle, is is the is the same it's such a fascinating period in our earth's history and i'm very grateful that you've been able to spare the time to talk about your research so uh what are you working on currently shuhai uh what are your latest projects my current research interest is to broaden and deepen the study of early animal evolution so by broadening um my research is to, you know, to explore the Ediacaran period using interdisciplinary tools, uh, particularly to understand the interplay between life and the environment, mm. uh, how life changed the environment and how environment uh, changed life or evolution. Uh, they, there's still a lot of unresolved questions about the Ediacaran evolution. Uh, for example, how much oxygen was there? Um, what kind of animals, whether they, there's any ecological interactions between Ediacaran animals and other forms of life? Uh, whether oxygen was a limiting factor for animal activity in the Ediacaran period? And, and climate change is a big um, topic uh, in the Ediacaran because uh, the Ediacaran uh, follow the, the wake of what is known as the Snowball Earth Glaciation, which is perhaps one of the largest glaciation mm -hmm. in Earth history, uh, and how that had an impact on biological uh, evolution. So the second aspect is to deepening uh, my research. By deepening, what I meant is to look at older rocks. So geologists usually use the word deep to mean ancient because mm. uh, the, the rocks are stacked on top of uh, each other. So older layers or deeper rocks are, are, are older. Um, so we have been looking at the the period, the geological periods before the Ediacaran periods, and that's the Cryogenian, uh, I mentioned Snowball Earth, Cryogenian period mm -hmm. is the period when Snowball Earth glaciation happened, and the period before the Cryogenian, the Tonian period, um, to look at the, 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 the evolution of history before the Ediacaran uh, and in deeper history. Um, so this, you know, not surprisingly, uh, the deeper we look, uh, the stranger the work they would look like, um, the more challenging uh, to make sense of everything we discover. But it's also more exciting to, you know, to look at all the rocks and to answer questions that, uh, that perhaps has, have the potential to reshape our understanding of early evolution of, of animals and life uh, in general. Um, so this is what you know, makes me you know, excited about um, my, my current and future research. Wow, looking forward to all of that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. I will leave links to your work and social media in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed.
for coming on to Evolution Soup. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and uh, I hope you know, the audience will enjoy this as well. <laughs> <laughs>